Welcome to this week's message from Alive Church. My name is Michael Brusicki and I'm the senior pastor of Alive Church. We have locations in Southeast Virginia, St. Louis, Missouri, our online church, as well as an international location in Manila, Philippines, a prison location in partnership with God Behind Bars, and we're believing God that only more and more people would come to know Him through our efforts. I'm so glad that you chose to take some time today to be encouraged through this message. You know, we think it's so important that we don't go through life simply living in mediocrity, but that we actually believe what Jesus said. He said the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that Jesus himself came that we would have life and have it to the full. Our hope for you today, that as you watch this message, you would be convicted potentially by the Holy Spirit, but you'd be encouraged as well by the Holy Spirit, that you would know you can live fully alive right now, right where you are, and fulfill God's purpose for your life. Enjoy this week's message. Hey, good morning, church. So glad to be with you today. It is a, a privilege to get to serve this house. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my wife Susie and I were the lead pastors of our St. Louis location. And, uh, and I'm excited to bring this series, uh, have the final message in the series. Uh, but before I jump in, if, if you don't know this about our family, we've got five kids aging from 18 to seven. And if you're a parent in the room, you know you can have some interesting conversations with your kids, like unannounced. They can just pop up with questions to you. Any parents in the room like, yeah, I just, in the grocery store, they'll ask me things, or I'm out in public, they'll ask me things. Oh, your kids are all really well behaved and that never happens to you. It's just me. Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit about my life. So this is what happens. So our kids will ask random questions. And because uh, my youngest one is seven, he's to the age where he's asking um, some unique questions. We'll just put it that way. And uh, he, he asked my wife, Susie, he says, what is puberty? Now listen, if this was baby number one, I wouldn't have known what to do. But baby number five, you're like, we got this. It's no problem. Because we had the question before. And so, so she, uh, she gives him an answer. And, uh, and then he listens. And then his response is, got it, and then just walks away. I promise you, this seven-year-old cannot fully comprehend what my wife told him. Like, but in his mind, he's like, got it, and then just goes. You're like, why do you tell that story? This is why I'm, I'm telling you today, because I think this is what can happen to you and I sometimes, is that we read the scriptures, God's speaking to us through, the, through his word, and there's a lot of depth to it, right? He's, he's speaking specifically to us, and then our response is like, got it, and then we just walk away. He's like, no, I got more for you. I want you, to, I know you can't fully comprehend and understand it, but I want you to get part of this. And so my hope for us is we're bringing this series to a conclusion is that we'll go, God, I, I, I'm getting it. How about that? I'm getting it. I'm getting a little bit more. I'm getting a little bit more because there's so much that he wants to share with us. And so I don't want to have an arrogant heart to think I've already got it and understand it. But instead I want to go, God, I know there's more to it. And I'm just hoping I get a glimpse of it. You with me? All right, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna read uh, chapter four in just a moment. If this is your first time with us or haven't been here during the series, we've been going through the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi is a tough book. It's why we call this series Taking God Seriously because there's some strong truths in there. But here's what we have to understand as we're beginning the chapters we dive in today is the very first, uh, the first verse that we see in there is God says, I love you. It's the foundation of what this book tells us that he loves us. And then the people's response to him was like, well, how do you love us? And then he responds again, they ask another, well, how? Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and you're trying to tell them something and they're like combating you back and forth? This is how I know God is way more patient than I am because if someone responded to me the way the Israelites responded to him in the passage, it would be, be a whole different story. But God's patient. So he responds to this and the foundation of it all is that he, I love you. There's so much more for you. If you follow my plan, it's gonna be so much better. You're doing things the wrong way. Instead, let's walk into a new way. Listen to my words so you can live differently. And as we understand the conclusion of this passage, we see a promise that God has for us. And so if you'll stand with me, we oftentimes will stand to honor God's word. It's Malachi 4, one through six. And, and, and the word that God has for us through this passage is a word of hope. For any one of us in the room, as we read through this and understand and dive into it today, I hope that's what we walk away with, is understanding the hope that we find in the Lord. Malachi 4, one through six. Surely the day is coming. It burns like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will send them on fire, will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet. 
and on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of, the Moses, of, my, Moses, of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and shake and strike the land with total destruction. <clears throat> Let's pray. God, we love you. And I pray for today that we take you serious. God, that we understand hope in this passage, that we, we get what you're trying to speak to us through the words uh, penned so many years ago. God, that we can trust you and we can know what it means to be in your will, not live in fear, but instead to have faith in your promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's on my fire, burned up, ashes, destruction. You're like, this is hope? Like, are you crazy? Or are you reading the same passage I am? And I am. Because I, understand, I want us to understand the context of what he's speaking. Because what he's telling us through these words is that justice is coming. See, justice is coming. It's, it's possible for wrong things to be made right. Because you and I both can understand this, that, that we live in a broken world. And injustices happen all the time. Bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And we're processing this and going, God, where are you in it all? Because what I see with my eyes is a lot of things that are going wrong with the world. And what we understand through this passage of, of Scripture is understanding that God is a just God, a loving God, and he will make things, he will make wrong things right. We can trust and know that he is good through it all. Here, here's what's something that's really important for us to to understand is that when we see all these bad things happen, we've got to know that God sees it too. He's like, I'm going to make things right in my timing in the right way. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. If you're taking notes, write this down. It's really deep and profound. It might take you a couple minutes to write it, but so get ready. Get your pens ready. You ready? God's got this. Just write that down. Because somebody in the room probably needs to hear that. Like you're walking through a situation that might be kind of tough and you just got, no, God's, God's got this. Like you don't know what's going on in my, in my marriage. No, God's got this. In my, in my, I'm parenting teenagers. I, no, God's got this. In my work situation at school, God's got this. Even though in the day-to-day it might be difficult, we understand that from the perspective of the Lord that he's got it, he's in control. We don't have to worry or be afraid, but instead we can look to the one who has everything in the palm of his hands. See, God's in control. Now, now, hear me out. I'm not saying that the world's perfect. Obviously, we, we've said in a moment ago that we live in a broken world, and there's a lot of things happening that we can't fully understand. But if I put myself in the place of hope and knowing that God's in control, it, it brings a, a different perspective of my life. So I've got an older brother, just he and I and our family, and, and he's, a, he's just two years older than me, and, and he's had a rough go. I mean, he, if anyone has experienced a, a life of, of feeling like the world's broken. It's been him. He's dealt with some health issues over the last several years. He has limitation in his knuck, neck muscles where he can't look left or, light, or left or right. He has to turn his whole body, and it's been this way for him for years. And he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease a few years ago, and so he's in and out of doctors all the time. He can't keep weight, and he's struggling with what's going on with his health, and he doesn't know what's necessarily ahead. But I talk to him often on the phone. We call each other, and, and, and he said this statement that was so, it was so simple and profound at the same time. He, he, says, he says this, and he said it a few times. He says, God is good and the moon is round. And that's how he ends the cup. God is good and the moon is round. And, okay, so my brother is one of the most intelligent people, if you're wondering, he's one of the most intelligent people I know. He's got his doctorate in philosophy, and many times when we have conversations, I'm struggling to keep up because he's just that smart. And I'm like, I think I know what you're saying, but okay. So when he says things like God is good and the moon is round, it's not his character. Like typically he uses much larger words than that. So I'm like, are you, are you writing your own children's book? Because that's what it sounds like. God is good and the moon is round. And so finally I'm like, hey, John, what do you mean? Like I, don't, I, I get this part, but what does this have to do with it? And he said, I know, God is, I know God is good. Like throughout all this situation that I'm walking through, I know God's good. And I recognize that the moon is round. Sometimes for, for me, I can't always see that the moon is round. Just like here on earth, I, I, I get a perspective. Maybe it looks like a waning moon. Maybe it looks like a, a, a new moon. I can't see the moon always from my eyes, but I know that the moon is always round. 
when you and I have this, this, this perspective of the Lord, we can know that he is good and the moon is round. Even if I can't always see it, I know that the moon is round and I know that God is good. Maybe for you in the room today, you just need to understand that a little bit more. No, I can't fully see what's going on, but I know that God is good and I know that even though I can't see it, the moon is still, still round. He's in control. We see he's good. And so Malachi 4.1 it tells us, it says, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that, come, that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you, who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with the healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. I don't know what a well-fed calf frolics like, but I can just imagine that it's a good thing. See, in that passage, what we see is we see these two verses, and it gives this example of what's going to happen for those who are outside of God's plan and what's going to happen for those that are in God's plan. Like, we see that, okay, God is a consuming fire. You can see the understanding, like, it, it, he gives this reference of his fire and this light and the sun, and what we understand is that as he explains that, like, that's, that's, a, that's a, a visual of, of God's judgment. So that the fire will consume, meaning that he will leave nothing undone. He's going to come through and consume all things that are Bad, but in the good side of it, you understand that we can, just like the sun has rays, we can be healed through its rays. The sun is good. It's a matter of perspective. It's truth that we find in his word. See, in this reference of fire, I, I had a, growing up, I had a fire stove in my basement. I'm so glad to be back in the Midwest where there's actually basements. There's none in the East Coast where we lived at. It was no basements, but we have them here in St. Louis, and so we had a basement growing up in this, in this fire stove. If you got close to it, if you touched it, it would burn you. So my parents, as good parents would, they would say, don't touch it. And as, as a kid, I'd go, ha, ha, ha. I'd walk by, and I'd touch it, walk on, keep going. And then one day when I did it, it was on. And I learned that day, don't ever touch it. God's given us a warning. He says, hey, listen, this is what's going to happen. There's a day that will come when wrong things will be made right. And fire is, is, has a purpose, right? Fire is not a bad thing. It, it creates warmth. But if you get in the way of the fire, it's destructive for your life. It's a problem. He goes on and he explains the sun, the rays from the sun will bring healing. Well, the sun is great. It brings life. But if you don't understand the power and the magnitude of the sun, what's going to happen is that you're going to be harmed by it. Because if you go outside and don't realize that the sun is hot, you're going to get sunburned. If you don't realize that the sun gives light, right, you're like, oh, it's great, it gives light, I can see around. But if we make the decision to stare at the sun, what's going to happen? It's going to cause us to go blind. See, we have to realize and understand the power of these two things that he's describing and talking about as we're reading through the passage. The light can bring health or it can bring harm. Depends on how we position ourselves in the light. So if we choose to do what's right in our own eyes, it will lead to destruction. But if we choose to follow God's ways and listen to his instruction and live our life glorifying him, it will ultimately lead to healing. So he says the sun will rise with healing in its rays. And I don't know what your church background is. But let me tell you, there's many of us in the room who maybe just need to understand God's healing power in our life. Like we've kept God at a distance and looking at him as this judge who's far off, but he's instead saying, hey, I'm here because I want to heal you because I love you so much. Like when we're in his will, we're following him, we're seeking him and knowing his ways are best. He says, I want to heal you. I want to bring healing to your life. See, and you and I, because the way we read this passage, at the time when Malachi was written, it closes out the Old Testament, but as, as New Testament believers, we can see the promises of Jesus shown. See, there's a familiar verse that the familiar verse. Everyone in the room will probably have heard this. If you've ever been to a sporting event or or even heard it stated out loud. It says John 3 16. You can probably state it, you can probably say it by memory. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then 17 goes on, it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. See, God came to the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it. And you're like, I get it. 
That's great. So did Everett. No, we got to get it. Like he came so that we could understand that he didn't come to condemn us, but he came to save us. He, he calls us to him, not condemns us. That's why he came. It could have ended way quicker, but he's like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm calling you to, I'm patient. I love you so much. I don't want you to experience my wrath, but instead I, I want you to know how much I care about you. He came to call us to him and not condemn us. We, we see in, in 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10, if, if you're new to Bible, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, one of his closest friends. I relate a lot to Peter because he was the guy who put his foot in his mouth all the time. Can anybody else relate with that? Like, you're like, I feel like I get my words more or wrong more often than I get them right. I feel like I jump ahead and I get it wrong. I feel like I'm, like, he, he was the guy who denied knowing Jesus, and, and he, just, he just said a lot of things wrong. But then whenever Jesus died, rose again, his life completely transformed. He became a leader in the church and became bold in the faith. And in 2 Peter, he writes this letter, chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. It says, the present heavens... And earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. He's like, don't get it twisted. It's going to happen. But to the Lord... A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. This is one of the hardest things for us to experience because if you're like me, I hate waiting. Like I'm like, I want it now. Are you, okay, God, no, no, that's too long. I waited too long. I want it right now. He's like, no, I'm, he's patient. I'm thankful for his patience in my life, in the day to day, and in the long term to understand he's patient with so many because he doesn't want anyone to perish. That person that drives you crazy, he's like, no, I don't want them to perish. If they're with you today at church, don't look at them. Because he's like, no, I'm calling all people to me. He's patient. He's loving. There's a promise that he's going to fulfill, that justice will come. Wrong things will be made right. But his promise is fulfilled through love and patience. Like he's like, I'm going to fulfill my promise. I'm telling you, it's going to happen one of these days, and I'm going to fulfill it because I love you so much, and I'm patient. If you don't know that, God is patient. Parents in the room, you can relate with this. Like when your kids are doing something wrong. Do we have any like, like counters? Like you're like, you better do that. Count of three. One, two. Anybody else do that in the room? Okay, good, I'm not alone. Last service I fell alone. I was like, I guess I'm the only parent who does this. But so as, as parents, like I'll do that. Like I really want my kids to do the right thing. And so I'm like, hey, you gotta you got you got just stop what you're doing. Okay, if I get to three, you could be in trouble. I don't know that I've ever gotten to three. I'd be like, one, two, two and a half, two and three quarters. Not that I'm not willing to, f- to follow through if I need to, because I am, but I'm like, I just don't want you to experience the pain. Like, I've got something better for you. This is God, and then like the smallest perspective of this, that's how God is with us. He's like, I just really want you to get it. I'm real patient. Two, seven, eight. He's because he loves us. He wants us to be in his will. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to revere him because it's so much better because we're never meant to be in control of our own lives, but instead to put him in control, to recognize that he's the one that's in control. God's promise is fulfilled through love and patience. He's not far off, he's not distant. His loving patience is what draws people to him. See, we have the opportunity today to not choose him out of fear of punishment, but instead to trust him because of his love for us. Another one of Jesus' disciples, John, he's known as the one that Jesus loved. He was a young man when he followed Jesus. He didn't always get it right, but as an older man, after he saw Jesus die and rise again, and he followed him, he brought so many to him, he, he writes a few letters to the people within the church. And I love how he, he gives context to a relationship with God because he gives, in 1 John, he gives an explanation of how you're supposed to live your life. And then he's like, you gotta do these things. And then he, find, he founds the whole thing in love. He says in, in, in John, 1 John 4, 16 through 18, 
He says, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here on this earth. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. John spent more time with Jesus than anybody, and what he gets out of that relationship and his time with him is understanding how much he loves him. And he, and he, he's like, listen, if you don't get this, I want you to understand that when you know, like when I know, I know, it's like then you don't have to be afraid. See, fear causes us to, to miss the relationship with God because we have a, a messed up perspective on who he is or fear, call, fear of other people will prevent us from living out the fulfillment of what God wants to do in our life. See, fear causes us to freeze. And John's like, but you just have to know. Like, you gotta know it. You gotta know it in your knower that you are loved. He says, know this above all else because then what perfect love does is it casts out all fear. You don't have to be afraid. See, we can read in Malachi 4, and it talks about what's going to happen on the day of justice and the day of judgment when Christ returns. We can see what's, what it says. Like, these wrong things will be made right. But when I understand the promise, I don't have to have the fear of punishment. If I understand the promise, I don't have fear of punishment. Because we know the one who's making the promise for us. We know that he, we don't have to be afraid of judgment because... Because we love him and he loves us, we don't have to be afraid. We should be the most hope-filled people in the world. Like as Christians, like that's how we should live our life. I'm so hope-filled. You're not afraid? No, I'm not afraid. Because I know the one who holds everything together. Well, you don't know what's going to happen. You're right, but I still know he's in control. Like in those moments when things seem so difficult and I can put the urgent over the important I've got to pause and go, no, God, I know that you're still in control. And I feel overwhelmed. No, God, I know you're still in control because I know who I am in you and I know whose I am. He calls us to him. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear judgment. We don't have to be afraid of the opinions of others. But instead, we know perfect love casts out all fear. What if we as believers in Jesus, like if we actually were committed to go, I know I don't fully understand, but I'm trying to get there. I'm working towards this perfect love and I don't want to be afraid. We would have a boldness that would draw others to Jesus. We would be a people who are committed to not letting fear drive our life because we just live differently. It's a daily decision not to let worry creep in. When Jesus had the opportunity to speak to the multitudes in his message during the Sermon on the Mount, he chose to hit this idea of worry and fear straight ahead because he understands how often that can consume our thoughts and our minds. Is anyone else struggle with worry in the room? It can take control of us, and we go, well, how's it going to work out? And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? He's like, stop worrying about the urgent and focus on the important. Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his life? By worrying. Why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor, labor or spin thread. And I tell you that even not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown away into the furnace tomorrow, don't, won't he do much more for you, ye of little faith? So don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And we heard this verse a few minutes ago. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He's like, seek me first, seek my kingdom first, and you won't have to worry about the troubles of this world. Like, if we slowed down for just a minute, and as I told you, I'm not really patient, and I would imagine you're probably in the same boat, but if we slowed down enough to, like, get a perspective of the world and go, no, God's taking care of that. He's got that under control. 
Even when I go to bed at night, the world's still spinning and the sun's gonna come up tomorrow because he's in control. I can rest assured that he's gonna take care of it. We live differently. We don't have to be afraid or get wrapped up in worry, but instead we seek him first, revere him in the way we live our life. See, my faith is in the one who made the day and it's more than enough faith to face the day. There was this song that I sang in a small country church. I grew up in small churches. 50 people was a big Sunday. And we had hymnals. You guys remember that, like hymnals? And, you, and if you think about it, you're used to hymnals. You might even remember certain numbers. And we had specials. They had great hearts and not great voices, but they would sing specials, and I love them. But one lady would sing a song, and it was, a, it was, it was this song that it was, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. And the lyric came to mind as I was preparing for this message. If you wonder if songs have power on you, they do, because it came right back to me. It's, it says, there are things about tomorrow that I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I may not know what's ahead, but I know the one who's walking with me as I'm going ahead. Like my, my kids can walk into a dark room when they know their dad's with them. My kids aren't afraid when they know that I'm with them. See, God is with us, so we don't have to be afraid of tomorrow. If we are able, again, to cast out all fear, to stand in perfect love, and to not let worry creep in, it will change our life and change the lives of those we're around. We should be the most hope-filled people because we know that God's got this. We live differently. We can live in today with a hope for tomorrow. So what does that look like? How do we live our life differently? Romans 12, 17 through 19. Paul writes these words. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. So how do we live our life? I'm not trying to take vengeance. I'm not trying to make things wrong. If there's an injustice in the world, I can work towards that. But I don't try and get an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth and think about how I'm going to get somebody back. But I'm going, no, God, I know you're in control. We can live differently because we know that. Don't try and repay evil for evil, but instead trusting God will help us be seen differently. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, the author of Hebrews tells us this. He's like, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And you're like, are, you just keep saying that. I'm like, I know. It's the only way I, I can help you live your life better is by keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because we can get caught up in all the things and, and we can get so worried filled and go, no, I'm just going to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. Like, I'm so thankful it's not work-based. Because if I, I know me. And I imagine you know you, and if you had to do it all because of your own goodness, you would probably fall short every single day. The Bible reminds us of that, that all have fallen short. So if you don't know that about yourself, you're struggling with pride, and and you need to understand. That was a joke. (laughs) Y'all like, man, he's harsh. (laughs) We all know ourselves. We know that we fall short. But I can know that I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. I don't have to prove myself to somebody else or try and be like somebody else. No, I need to keep my eyes fixed on him. Who ran the race before him, who persevered. And because of his perseverance, he fulfilled what God had for him. He fulfilled his plan here on earth. And because of that, we can be in the fullness of God because of our relationship with him. I don't have to be the one who proves myself. But I know the one who does. We live differently. Hebrews 12, 28, 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. I can know this is the God that we serve, that he is 
the one, that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. See, all these things around us can shake. Emotionally, if we're driven, like we can be up and down and up and down. It can feel like a roller coaster, but we are in a kingdom that will not be shaken. I love what Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 13. If you've never been to a wedding, you haven't heard this verse, but if you have been to a wedding, you've heard it. Because he, he says these things, he says, all things will pass away, but these three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. See, the kingdom that we serve, those ideas, those ideals are lived out. Faith, hope, and love. And as I said before, as followers of Jesus, we should be the most hope-filled people because we know that he's in control. We get to be a part of this unshakable kingdom. In every circumstance, in every season, we can serve him in awe. Malachi 4, 4 through 6. continues with this. It says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. If you read that passage, what we see is you see the conclusion of the Old Testament written out, and he wraps it up in just a few sentences, he says, remember the law of Moses. Look back to what was. Remember when I told you about my standard of living and how you're supposed to live your life. And then look ahead to the days when the prophet will come. So the, the law and the prophets fulfilled. The prophet of Elijah, we, we, we see Jesus talk about that in the New Testament. That John the Baptist is, has the same spirit of Elijah. And he was the forerunner, made the way, paved the way for the Lord. It's the law and the prophets. So we had Jesus come. But then we also have the privilege to look forward to the day that Jesus will return again. So like we're in the now and the not yet. Yes, Jesus came so that we can have hope, but I know he's gonna come back so that all things will be made right. And then there's this, this, this like tagged on sentence at the end. It says, draw the parents, the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. So he's like, I'm gonna make wrong things right. We're gonna, we're gonna see the evil that is done. It will be eradicated. Those who follow me, you'll be jumping around for joy. It will be made right and perfect. And my desire is that we'll see unity happen. He says, draw the, the hearts of the parents to the children and the children to their parents because when unity happens within followers of Jesus, there's nothing that can stop it. So I think about this for us as a church. Like what if we made the decision to be united? Not uniformity, but to be united. Like I don't have to get caught up and wrapped up in all the other things that are happening and, and, and when I watch the news or I scroll on social media and those, those things that can cause this anxiety to fear to come in, but instead, no, I'm focused on building unity of the church to be the hope of the world. Because I can trust and know that he is in control. I know that God's got this. See, I'm not, I'm not ignorant. No, in fact, I'm well informed. You're like, well, don't you know what's going on? No, I, I, I don't worry so much about that. I'm well informed of what the word of God says. And he will make wrong things right. We can trust him. And I'll put my faith and my trust in him every single day of the week. I have not found a better way to live. And I promise you this room is filled with people who will say, I have not found a better way to live. I will give my life to this. And when we choose to give, live a life of unity together, people have to take notice. And so I want to encourage you to, would you stand with me today as we bring our Malachi series to a, a close? I pray for each one of us that we'll be able to take God seriously and recognize that, that he is a God of love, a God of patience, a God of justice. He's drawing us to him. He's not slow, but instead he's patient. God, I thank you for the promises of your word. God, I thank you as, that we re, as we have read through Malachi, as we read the last chapter today. God, we see the day to come, what we can look forward to in the days ahead, that you will make wrong things right. I pray for every single person in the room who's struggling, 
who's struggling to see you moving and working in their lives. God, I pray that they get a, a better glimpse and understanding of your love for them. God, that you're not far off, but you are close. You're not a judge that sits on a seat so far away, but you're a loving Father who's right here with us, who's leading us into the days ahead. I pray that each one of us can walk in peace. That perfect love will cast out all fear in our life. That we can run the race before us because our eyes are fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And in any part of our life where we have tried to take control and we have met a wall, God, I pray that we give control up to you and we can trust you that you'll make a way. Where we see a wall, you'll make a way. God, we thank you that in our hearts of heart of hearts that we can just know that you've got this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. If this message impacted you in any way, we encourage you to like and share it out. We post new messages every single week, so subscribe if you haven't already. You can also watch past messages, all geared towards helping you live fully alive. To stay up to date with everything going on at Alive Church, follow us on social media or visit our website, livefullyalive.com.